All right, I want to welcome everyone back to FIU's fifth annual Hemispheric Security Conference. Um, it is now my honor to introduce Lieutenant General Fred Rudesheim. Uh, General Rudesheim is director of the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies in Washington. He was born and raised for 18 years in the Republic of Panama, commissioned as a distinguished military graduate from the University of Texas in 1981, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. He holds master degrees in international relations from Troy University, in strategic studies from the US Army War College, and in, and in advanced military studies from US, uh, US Army Command and General Staff College. Uh, he served as the commander of the 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, deploying to Operation Iraqi Freedom from April 2003 to March 2004. He later returned as Deputy Commanding General of the 1st Cavalry Division and Multinational Division in Baghdad, Iraq from February 2009 to January 2010. And his most recent command prior to taking a seat at the Perry Center was, at the, was the commander for U.S. Uh, Army South in Fort Sam Houston. So without further ado, General Rudesheim, it's my honor to cede the floor to you. Thanks very much, uh, Brian. If, um, if I could get a little assistance to turn on my video, I'd much appreciate it. Uh, not that anybody actually, there we go. And once again, uh, thanks very much, Brian. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today. I think we have a, a great panel. Uh, it's a robust topic, uh, one that, uh, that we have dealt with over and over again, but it, uh, it requires so much more thought and hopefully we can, we can generate uh, that thought in the, in the Q&A uh, as, we, as we continue. I want to again thank everybody that's uh, set this up. FIU, thank you very much for hosting. Uh, to, uh, to Dr. Frank Mora, I owe you, uh, Frank, you have, you've answered the call uh, of the Perry Center more than once. Um, a number of times, and, and so thank you so very much. Uh, the Perry Center is absolutely um, a full partner with FIU, uh, even as we respond to our principal stakeholders at Department of Defense, Southcom, and, and Northcom. So again, um, I want to uh, I want to set the stage, and then turn it over to. Um, our, our four distinguished panelists to talk about this, this all important topic, the, the evolution of the military institutions of the, of the militaries in the, in the region. And what does that mean? Um, about two years ago, I had the opportunity to speak at uh, the defense ministerials in Mexico. And I had, uh, I had the opportunity to speak on this very topic, it, uh, the evolving roles of the military. My presentation was relatively short, and I can I can give you the I can give you the uh, the single the single concept that that would possibly be a good point of, of tea up here, and that is the notion that there is a clash of the traditional roles of the military and then the evolving roles of the military. As a as a retired military person. Um, I can say with some certainty that the majority of the military do not want to take on um, the roles of security, making that not so clean distinction between security and defense, security being primarily inward looking and in, in defense uh, or, or protection of the population inside of the borders and defense being that external security, protection of the borders, protection of the state. So the military's created to protect the state, but what about evolving roles as the threat seems more inward leaning or being produced from the inside? This is the, this is the challenge I think that many of the militaries are facing uh, in this region. And so this evolves into the question of how does security and defense fit together? And, and I would offer for consideration that they overlap and where they overlap, it's sort of who has it. It's a jump ball. Whether it does it belong to the security sector and that is the military, or does it belong to the police and and instruments uh, of of internal security? And so that's the question. What what does that middle sliver look like? 
because you still have traditional defense roles and missions. You have uh, you have policing and the traditional roles of internal protection of the population. But what if this this enemy, the common enemy, has a lot of firepower? What if they have a lot of money and they can overwhelm internal security forces? But then do you use the defense forces that aren't trained properly for that mission? And by the way, in many cases, uh, legally, they are limited or at risk in some cases if they are used for internal, internal security missions. And so maybe there's a need for an intermediate force. Maybe there's a need for some, some kind of organization or unit that is trained to handle the higher end of security or the lower end of defense. That is one of the, the prime considerations that we have uh, throughout the region. Our four speakers are gonna, are gonna talk about the issues that concern uh, the region and, and our security forces, uh, primarily from uh, the position of their respective countries from, from uh, whence they've come. So uh, we're gonna have Juan Carlos Gomez, retired military uh, Brigadier General from uh, Colombia, who, who is going to be our first speaker. Then we'll have uh, Inigo Guevara from Mexico uh, coming up next, then Fabiana Pereira talking about Venezuela, and then finally Luis Bittencourt talking about Brazil. We could have included any number of other countries, but I think we can, with these four countries, have a fair representation of the challenge, and certainly we can take it on beyond the borders of of just these four countries as we go into Q&A. And so um, really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you all for being here with us. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Juan Carlos Gomez. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen that, I, that are joining this um, conference. Good morning, dear panelists. Okay, I will divide this 10 minutes that I have in two parts. First, I will try to explain the reason why we are seeing the more presence of the military forces in the streets nowadays. And I'm not talking just about Colombia. I will try to talk about the, the whole continent. I will try to talk about Latin America. So there are three main reasons that I find very important to, to consider the reason why military forces are involved in public life. The first one is the levels of violence and insecurity. It is not new in the continent to have the military forces involved in problems of security. And we can see Brazil, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Colombia, and when, when you see the rates of homicides in the world, in many cities around the world, and you see the cities in Latin America, sadly, many of our cities are among the most dangerous cities in the world. And let's say cities from Mexico, from Venezuela, from Guatemala, from Honduras, from El Salvador, from the Caribbean, so the military forces are committed in security in many places. They are dealing with narco trafficking, with illegal fishing and too many other duties. So it's common to see military forces involved in security in Latin America. The second reason why we see military forces and this happened recently was the increase of social discontent. And sometimes, they express very violent, like the demonstrations we saw in Santiago, in Managua, in Bogota, and for sure, the government took them to the street, not as the first line, but being there as a dissuasive force. And I think that is the best way for military if they have to be part of this kind of situation to avoid any clashes with civil population. We know that has created too many problems in the past. 
And the third reason why we see military forces in the street, and this one is the one that I like the most, is because the military forces are key in humanitarian assistance and in disaster relief. One of the most trusted institutions among population are the military forces. When you see problems like floods, hurricanes, fire, earthquakes, the military are there present trying to support the population. Today, with COVID-19, from Mexico to Chile, all the military forces are committed to support society with all the capabilities they have trying to support the government and the people who are affected for COVID. Now I'm working in Mexico, very close to the military forces and the military forces in Central America. And I have seen how the military forces are committed to support the population affected by COVID-19, protecting hospitals, the, the doctors, the nurses that are affected sometimes. They are doing the management of dead bodies. They are involved in many, many things that are very far from their traditional professions. Okay, now I will talk about four things that, that I think are important. One are the strengths of the military forces that I think, that's my opinion. What are their responsibilities they have? Then I will talk about the weaknesses and the risk to have them present. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about the future. What could be the future for the military forces? The strengths, 200 years of history. The military forces are in the roots of society. They are in the heart of the population. Being in the military, and I can say this is a vocation. You are in the military because you really want to serve. You really want, you really want to serve to your country, to your people, to your flag. The last three years, I have spent my time in a humanitarian organization. And I have realized that the most humanitarian organization is the military. They are really committed to humanitarian actions. The military career is a dream for many young men and women. They really want to, to, to be part of the military forces. This is a professional career. When you see the pyramidal hierarchical size of the institution, the discipline, the doctrine, the logistics they have, the distribution of the units in the, in the territory, the low permeability to corruption, the effectiveness in operations, then you understand why the government take them to the streets. All these facts make of the military forces a vital asset for the existence and the strength of the state. Let's talk about the responsibilities. They are tied to constitution and law, to international treaties and to international conventions. But more importantly, they are tied to their values, being honor the most important value. So these are institutions in who you can believe. And I think the institutions have been changing. They have changed. They are trends in, I think that now you can say that there is a positive civilian control over the military. The judicial system has worked. The mistakes and the crimes that happened in the past the military who were involved pay for them. So now commanders are accountable. They know the responsibility they have. They respect and know their role in society. Military know they are here to defend democracy and to defend democratic values. What are the weaknesses and risks that armed forces can face? The past, yes, is true. In the 70s, last century, 
the concept of national security doctrine, all this during the Cold War and before the fall of the Berlin Wall. But this is different today. We are in a new century. I am a military retire. I spent 33 years in the military, plus three that I have in the civilian life. And I never in my military career study this doctrine of national security. But still, there are people trying to disqualify the military institution by saying are talking or talking about this national security doctrine. The mistakes that happened in the past cannot happen again. But now we are facing another problem, and that is the polarization, the politic polarizations. And they are people trying to erode the military capacity, to diminish the military organization, to affect the military organization. And that is a big mistake. But also, it is a big mistake trying to push the military to take action in military, in, in political positions that they do not have to be part. So what are the risks now? Human right abuses, excesses in the use of force, and something very dangerous and military forces have to take into account and is corruption. Military forces have to avoid corruption. Military have to continue in the center defending democratic institution and values. These points make armed forces legitimate and guarantees that they are essential and relevant for the survival of the state. Okay, last point, future. What do I think about the future? Honestly, and even though we are in a terrible moment of humanity, but I see a promising moment for the military forces. There are many, plenty of opportunities. As I mentioned before, armed forces are in the heart of the population. They are part of the soul of nations in Latin America. The Colombian case, 1% of the Colombian populations are in the military forces or in the police. Half a million people working to serve to the population. So you cannot erase the military forces and the security forces from the map overnight. So they are very important in humanitarian response. They are key in disasters relief. The traditional mandate, of course, in defense, they have to fulfill the constitution. They have to protect sovereignty, integrity, the independence of the state, and they have to keep the constitutional order in the case of Colombia. The constitution in Colombia impose responsibilities in security for the military forces. But there are new missions and there are challenges of the 21st century, internal security and transnational crime. Mostly all criminal problems are in the middle of the population and use and affect the population. So we have to have a multidimensional approach and response to these problems, not only the military forces, but other institutions of the states. But first, you have to have security. Examples that like we have seen in Syria, I had the opportunity to be there in Yemen, and the problems are in the middle of the population. According to Raquel Kleinfeld in her book, Savage Order, 83% of the deaths, violent deaths occur in other situations of violence, not in conflicts. So you can call them armed groups, maras, carteles, dissidents, illegal self-defense, whatever. But they are in the middle of the population and armed forces have to deal with them and have to protect pop, pr uh, population inside the cities. There is a, a book, and I will finish soon. Yeah. There is a book from General Rupert Smith. The name is The Utility of Force. And 
And he's very clear saying that nowadays confrontations are in the middle of the population. And military forces have to confront this reality, but has to be precise in the use of force. Independently of how evil, how evil is your enemy, you cannot commit abuses or excesses in the use of force in the middle of the population. If you do so, soon you will have the whole population against the military forces and against the government. So that's why military forces have to be very well equipped, very well trained. The intelligence is key, human and technical intelligence, precision, they have to perform surgical military operations. I honestly believe the future is hopeful for the participation of the military in society. What will assure the military presence and strength in, in, in all this is legitimacy. And how do you get legitimacy? Being effective in the mission that you have and at the same time, fulfill the mission, of course, and in a compliance with the law, human rights law, international humanitarian law, and avoid corruption. Thank you very much, General. Juan Carlos, muchísimas gracias. That was a, a great kickoff. And uh, I wanna make sure we preserve the maximum amount of time. I'll go straight to our, our next presenter, Inigo Guevara. Uh, muy buenos días. Inigo, please take it over. Thank you. Thank you, General uh, Rudashine, for the invitation, fellow panelists, uh, Frank and Brian. Uh, great to see you guys here. Um, okay, so I'm going to dive straight in uh, for uh, time purposes and discuss uh, the Mexican military, which is, I, we could say, definitely a traditionally has been a non traditional military. Uh, over the past 50 years. And let me unpack that um, a little bit. The Mexican military operates under um, three main mandates, three main missions, which are national defense, internal security, and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief type of operations. Um, there's a couple of, of, of more that pile up there to provide um, social services, etc. But these three make up the main pillars of uh, Mexican military thinking. And along those lines, uh, when we discuss the first priority, which is national defense, that has, um, we could say since the end of World War II, been somewhat relegated um, to the fact that the current Mexican military is not really trained, equipped, or organized uh, to fight any of its neighbors. And it's also uh, rather limited in terms of power projection in a conventional capacity. So with no conventional direct threats, uh, the military, the Mexican military has really uh, evolved uh, to uh, concentrate on both internal security as well as uh, disaster relief type of operations. In internal security, uh, the Mexican military has really found the mainstream of its of its mission. Uh, born over a hundred years ago, uh, the main mandate of the Mexican military was to keep the country together. It wasn't to fight off the U.S. It wasn't to fight off Guatemala or Belize. It was uh, definitely to maintain the country together, as as it was born during the most bloody civil war. Uh, that our hemisphere has ever seen. So uh, along those lines, over the past 50 years, the Mexican military has been committed to counter narcotic operations. And it's been really over the past 14 years, since 2006, that the tempo of operations have increased um, and Mexican citizens, Mexican society has had a lot more contact with its military uh, deployed in the streets, sometimes in direct support, and in some cases, in direct replacement of some law enforcement agencies. So um, we see 
that the use of the Mexican military in these circumstances has been mainly due to the failure of uh, political civilian institutions to create uh, credible police forces. Along those lines, uh, humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster relief has also been a mainstay of the Mexican military for about coming up on 55 years now. Um, the, the Mexican army and the Mexican navy deploy in what's called Plan D DN3 or Plan Marina in support directly of the Mexican population and as well as some international operations as well. This basically means that the Mexican military has um, the right infrastructure to provide uh, a network of installations throughout the country, which gives it national coverage. And it also has the right doctrine and organization, which is aligned to support uh, both internal security and the humanitarian assistance roles. What it does lack is the appropriate amount of resources. And let me dive a little bit into that. The lack of resources uh, for the Mexican military, which has traditionally been underfunded, is uh, not really something that we can uh, attribute to either the current ad administration or past administrations. Over the past 50 years or so, the Mexican military has only received 0.5% uh, of GDP in terms of uh, its operating budget. If we compare that to the rest of Latin America, we see that Latin American countries uh, on average receive about 1% of GDP. And that is uh, still about half of what the global GDP uh, index tells us, which uh, the world basically spends uh, or invests 2% of, of the world's GDP in defense. So if we analyze it, the Mexican military basically gets one fourth of what the global average on the defense expenditure uh, is. How does this translate? Well, this obviously translates into a lack of capabilities. Um, for instance, uh, the Mexican military has relatively poor uh, capacity to control its airspa airspace, with only 30% of Mexican airspace covered by military radars. Um, we have a Navy, which is somewhat limited to a Coast Guard function with uh, some token uh, blue water uh, functions, particularly with the previous administration who set up on a, um, frankly, pretty well thought of uh, project to build up a uh, fleet of uh, long range ocean patrol ba vessels uh, based on a light frigate uh, concept. And uh, unfortunately that naval construction uh, project has now come up to a standstill with the current administration, but probably will be reactivated uh, during the next administration, hopefully. And then in terms of the army, we have an army relegated uh, to law enforcement support uh, as well as counter narcotics, uh, which again, in the previous administration did take strides uh, to increase its presence in the diplomatic stage, in the international stage, by taking up leadership positions in multilateral organizations, and then following up that with um, developing a key peacekeeping uh, operation type of um, capacity. Uh, to which Mexico had been relatively shy over the past several decades. With that in place, um, those uh, two level of engagements uh, appear to be maintained. However, they don't seem to be growing in the, in the short term. So now we move over to what we would have to call the basically even less than non-traditional roles. Uh, to which we've seen the Mexican military being engaged uh, recently, uh, which includes the construction and potentially likely operation of uh, Mexico City's future international airport, uh, which has really absorbed a lot of its resources and a, a lot of its focus um, 
we've seen the, the military being used in environmental cleanup operations, such as the Navy being assigned uh, to clean up sargassum uh, off the coasts of Cancun, and uh, also to provide logistics and uh, security for the government's oil and um, gasoline um, transportation strategies um, last early last year. But foremost, the military has been tasked with supporting the creation of a National Guard. A National Guard being an intermediate force that has absorbed now the federal police in Mexico and has taken up contingents from um, the Army's military police as well as the Navy's naval police to create um, a, 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 a new force that can operate under civilian command uh, as the main uh, law enforcement agency throughout Mexico. And that has really uh, taken uh, a toll on most of its um, development efforts and will continue to do so over the upcoming years. And last but not least, I can only say as a defense analyst that I'm amazed and really admire the way that the military, the Mexican military has been able to cope and address all of these issues with only uh, frankly, a fraction of a budget that it should be assigned and can only provide hope that in the future, it will be much more capable if uh, it's ever assigned a realistic budget. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Inigo. And uh, once again, we're, we're getting our questions uh, piling up, but I want to make sure that uh, we get all four of our panelists uh, to to uh, have their remarks, and then we'll, we'll go to the Q&A. Please go ahead and continue to uh, send in your questions in English or in Spanish or uh, in Portuguese as you like. Eh, ahora sigamos con Fabiana Pereira. Fabiana, please. There you go. Thank you, sir, and thank you to FIU for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, it is now my turn to discuss Venezuelan armed forces, which I think is going to go great because this is not a controversial or a contentious subject at all. In thinking about the Venezuelan armed forces, I want to call your attention to three principal distinctions that I think are key to understanding what's happening in the country. And a lot of this tracks very well um, with what director of the Perry Center uh, said in his introductory remarks. The three distinctions I want to call your attention to are the distinction between the state and the regime first, the distinction between defense and security, such as it is, as the second one, and the distinction between civilian and military spheres, as the third one. I will address each of these in turn. Starting with the distinction between the state and the regime, we see that normally uh, armed forces of a country are supposed to work to preserve the integrity of the state so that the flag of the country means something and to preserve um, the state from the borders, it, to make sure that the borders of the state mean something so that they should be oriented at protecting the state from the borders out. In Venezuela, we see that the armed forces, though initially a very professional armed forces that work closely with US armed forces uh, for many decades have now turned into an armed forces that are focused towards protecting the regime. So they have changed their orientation from defending the borders and the territorial integrity of Venezuela to protecting those in power in Venezuela, to protecting the regime. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly when this happened, uh, as it is to say when it was that Venezuela went from being a celebrated democracy to becoming an autocracy, um, depending on who you ask that, uh, is placed somewhere between 2003 to at the latest 2010. I think after 2010, there's wide agreement that Venezuela is no longer a democracy. And tracking with that agreement is the notion that the armed forces no longer protect the state, but instead protect the regime. Um, this is something that Chavez created and that Maduro benefited from through a very slow series of institutional changes that reoriented the military toward this new mission of making sure that Chavez or Maduro stay in power. I think we can think of the first change as being moving the organization, moving the armed forces from being a completely apolitical organization 
um, at the time that Chavez was elected, members of the Venezuelan armed forces were not even allowed to vote. One of the very first things that Chavez did as president was allowing Venezuelan military to vote, which started to slowly introduce politicization um, into the armed forces. Um, and from that, we have experienced, um, we have witnessed 20 years of eroding professionalism of the armed forces and this reorientation away from protecting the state and toward protecting the regime. The second distinction that I think makes sense to talk about when we talk about Venezuela is this distinction between defense and security. I agree with our director, uh, General Rudashem, when he talks about these two spheres being overlapping. And I think they are to an extent, but the primary role of the armed forces can, should continue to be the defense of the state, as I just explained, um, and not internal security. In fact, uh, missions that relate to internal security are often combined and are the exception rather than the norm um, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which uh, being that missions related to internal security expose members of the armed forces toward dealing directly with civilians, which is kind of outside um, of the scope of their work. In Venezuela, we have seen that the armed forces have taken on internal security missions, again, aimed at protecting the regime, not aimed at protecting against internal threats like drug trafficking um, or perhaps uh, disasters, uh, response to natural disasters, but instead internal security aimed at protecting um, the regime. Even though this is taking place, this is happening against a background where we see that the regime, uh, currently led by Maduro, of course, utilizes external threats and the defense mission of the armed forces as a way to justify spending and investment uh, in weapons for the armed forces. So there's kind of a mismatch between uh, the rhetoric of the regime, which insists on an external threat to Venezuela. Occasionally that threat um, is the US when we see an increase in, in American rhetoric. Um, sometimes it's Colombia, sometimes it's Colombia as a proxy for the US. And then that's being used to justify an increase in um, spending in the armed forces. And then the armed forces themselves uh, are mostly reoriented toward these um, internal security missions. I think one clear example of this was the recent botched pseudo coup uh, situation that Venezuela experienced and of which there were questions in the earlier panel. The response to that was handled in Venezuela mostly by the Minister of the Interior and to some degree by the Minister of the Interior in conjunction with the Minister of Defense, which again points um, to this new orientation of the armed forces toward internal security missions in a way from defense of the country, defense of the state. The third distinction that I wanna to address today is the distinction between the civilian and military spheres. Um, this is something where every Latin American country has a history of civilian military relations. Every Latin American country is working toward having positive civilian military relationships. And a big part of that involves really fully differentiating the two spheres, people um, that are in uniform and people that are not in uniform. In Venezuela, of the three distinctions I've talked about, this has become the most blurred. And this has happened through a number of actions. One of them is the creation of the militia in Venezuela. Uh, the militia are technically part of the armed forces, or are administered by the armed forces, but is a security institution composed of civilians who wear a uniform that is distinct from the uniform of the armed forces, but it's still a uniform. Uh, and that is exactly as complicated as I made it sound. And I think that example more than anything illustrates the blurring of the lines between what is civilian and what is military in Venezuela. A second example um, has to do with the amount of economic power that has been given to uniform uh, military personnel in Venezuela who are now in charge of key strategic industries, including the oil industry, um, an industry in Venezuela that was for years run by politically appointed civilians and was seen as an example of meritocracy um, at work and kind of the, I don't wanna say crown jewel because it sounds regal, but kind of the crown jewel um, of the country. So that now we have in Venezuela, um, Military is doing civilian occupation, civilians doing 
uh, what used to be military rules. So again, to recap, the three distinctions that we see uh, blurred in Venezuela are the, dis or the distinction between the state and the regime, where we see complete reorientation toward protecting the regime, the distinction between defense and security, where we see the armed forces in their effort to protect the regime being oriented toward internal security missions uh, and away from traditional defense missions. And the third one, the sphere of military versus uh, civilian becoming blurred. Um, even during Chavez's presidency, um, even though he was retired from the armed forces, he insisted on wearing the uniform for a number of official addresses. So the roots of these problems go back at this point about two decades. It will be difficult to solve uh, if there is a democratic transition in Venezuela. However, if it is a democratic, if there is a Venezuelan, a transition to democracy in Venezuela, which is something that I hope we see, addressing these three distinctions and trying to reorient and reprofessionalize the military is going to be the first most important task facing a new democracy. Reestablishing security in the country, reestablishing trust in the armed forces in the country is going to be key to any kind of economic development or any prosperous future um, for the country. And with that, I think I used up my time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Fabiana. Uh, again, there's a number of questions about Venezuela and uh, we'll get those in, 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 uh, in just a moment, but I wanna uh, pass the word to uh, the distinguished Dr. Luis Bittencourt and, uh, and please, Luis, take over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the distinguished. Uh, if we close our eyes in front of a Brazilian map, map of Brazil, and we put the finger anywhere in that triangular mass of 18 million and 500,000 kilometers, square kilometers, in any point of that, I can tell you for sure that you will identify a military presence there. The Brazil, Brazilian military is the only institution capable of reach any part of the Brazilian territory. And they can tell you that they are there right now. And probably they are there, they are now helping the federal government with transportation, with communication, with hospitals helping in the pandemic crisis there. However, this is not what defines the Brazilian military mission or the Brazilian Armed Forces mission. This is a subsidiary mission. And this, I think, is quite important. I was listening carefully to what uh, our good friend Zinigo and Juan Carlos said in the beginning. I understand the points using military in different jobs, and particularly to address this uh, tremendous other disease, which is the organized crime in the region. But I think we have to make a careful paradox here, a careful distinction here between what defines a military force and what is a subsidiary action that they can undertake because the reality of their countries requires that. And this applies well to the case of Brazil. So just for us to remember some points here, Brazil has the second largest military in the hemisphere. So we are talking about uh, active personnel of 334,000 soldiers, troops. We are talking about the budget of $27 billion, uh, we are, which is 1.5% of GDP. It is still below uh, what Inigo taught us should be the ideal perhaps. We are talking about uh, 222,000 troops in the army 80,000 in the Navy, 80,000 in the Air Force, roughly. But also we are talking about uh, 110 ships in the Navy. We are talking about uh, a nuclear program, submarine being developed by the Navy. Probably uh, this is the goal. The target is to have that by the end of the decade. It's a big challenge, but it's the goal. And this underscores the professional interest that. And then we talk about the Air Force, for example. And we must remember that the Air Force is just 
uh, acquiring a grip pen uh, fighter. But in addition to that, there is Embraer, which provides a, a transport aircraft, the KC-309, which is relatively sophisticated or quite well sophisticated and adapted to a niche in the military market, which probably will be uh, quite well, will be doing quite well. And then we have also the Tucanos. I mean, I'm trying to make a case of uh, a considerable sophistication of uh, pure military interests according to the Brazilian traditional military culture. So this is a this is typically a professional military in defense of sovereignty. Now there are some curious contradictions here. If you look at the Brazilian national strategy, which has been published some ten years ago, you look at that. It begins with the phrase that Brazil is a peaceful country per tradition and conviction, which is certainly quite interesting, meaning that the Brazilian armed forces are basically tailored for defending the country. At the same time, Brazil is very proud to uh, express, to voice that it lives in peace with ten, 10 neighbors for over a century, well over a century. So it's a satisfied country in this sense. So what's the, what's the fear, what's the concern of Brazilian sovereignty? Well, the intention or the attention for that or the logic for that is the following. Uh, if we don't have a military force proportional to the size of the country, to the population of the country, to the geostrategic importance of the country, then it may attract the interests of others, not necessarily neighbors. And uh, I like what Admiral Fowler said about the importance of the neighborhood in the region and the way the U.S. Southcom is uh, working with the neighbors uh, to face the challenges in the region. But when we talk about the title of this panel, uh, the evolving role of the military in the region, we also have to look carefully and when, the, when the, our, our, our actor is Brazil, uh, we, we have to look at some interesting paradoxes. And I believe the case of Brazil helped us also to put whatever ha is happening in the region, not only in Brazil, but also in Argentina, also in Chile, also in Paraguay, Uruguay, the countries in the region. We must not forget that not long ago, those countries were under military regimes or dictatorships. And again, the case of Brazil is different because differently from Chile, for example, which one dictator was there for a long time, or Argentina, we, we have this uh, trio or, or of uh, generals controlling the country. In Brazil, at every four years, we had a new general elected indirectly. So as a sort of different uh, dictatorship. However, with no doubt, it was a military administration in the country. And with all power that the military usually require for this administration. Therefore, when we talk about the evolving role of the military, it's important to, to consider that period in the case of Brazil, 1985 was when it finished this regime. And we went back to democracy. Without a tradition of democracy, there's a story of uh, several interventions by the military throughout the Brazilian history. But in that point, after being 21 years, for 21 years in control of the political power, the military then left. And then it's important to, to observe how the transition has affected the ethos of the military in Brazil. I, I was uh, honored by, by the uh, Florida International University two years ago to publish a paper on the Brazilian national military culture in which I tried to demonstrate how important is this culture, how robust is this, uh, is this culture, and how the Brazilian military are proud to have this clear sense of values, of uh, interests, of why they exist in Brazil. They have this clear sense. They have their schools, they have their judicial system, and they uh, are, as, as many military are very disciplined to that. So it's important to consider how they're, in the first point, how they transition it from this old regime in which they were in control of the political power, then to recover the nature of a military force, however, within a democratic environment. The first five years, six years were dramatic because they had to really adapt to that, to that new reality. And they did not know exactly where to go. And as you know, you may challenge the military with many things, but don't take a plan out of 10, the possibility of planning. 
So they were a little bit lost in this period. But then after the 1990s, when they start to rethink and it was a model of transition. To, so this is truly an evolution of the role of the military from intervening in the political uh, life, the realm of the state to create, to create a new sense of military within a democratic environment in Brazil. And then we had in a sequence, several uh, important steps. For example, the first Minister of Defense, civilian Minister of Defense was created by Fernando Henrique Cardoso during the administration, administration of Fernando Henrique, a published policy of defense, a national security strategy, a national defense strategy, a white book, all of those things that are considered by many military in Brazil as this is never going to happen in Brazil. Suddenly, Brazil was having those documents. So we had a, a tremendous progress in terms of that adaptation of this institution strong institution as a military institution, but adaptation to the Brazilian democracy. And then comes the challenge of the crime, which was addressed by Inigo and addressed also by Juan Carlos and also a little bit by Fabiana. But the case of Brazil is again curious because we had this huge problems of internal crime in Brazil in ma major urban centers in Brazil. We had the case of Rio, but Rio is not in, in terms of statistics, it's not the most serious one, but it's, most, it's the most visible one. But we had problems in Sao Paulo, we had in North, Northeast capitals, oh, crime is all over that. So why not use the military? Since this is a so uh, solid institution, we should use that. They do well in so many things. They are building roads and then building hospitals and do, why not the military? So I have a case uh, for not to use the military. I, I would use the military because they are not trained for that. Their force is not for that. They're, they are not specialized in police inquiries and enforcement activities. And the use in Brazil has been an ultimate resource, as ultimate resource. And the last intervention in Rio de Janeiro two years ago was a case in point. Um, was, uh, there's, a, there's a clause in the constitution that allows the government of states, by the way, the responsibility of uh, crime to fight crime is primary for state governors. Brazil is a federal institution as well as the United States, for example. So the responsibility to fight crime is the governors, unless there is a federal crime and then you have the federal police. Of course, the problem then is not the uh, capacity of the military to do something to fight crime, it's the incapacity of the police. So to fight crime, we must first address this reality of the incapacity of the police in, in, in the state governance. So, uh, but in the case of the Rio, then there was a, a case in which the state was under complete lack of political power. The governor was in jail, the deputy governor was in jail for accused of corruption. The, the police was clearly uh, short of equipment. They, they had not been modernized for years, for decades. So the role of the military intervention was quite, quite delimited. The military doing that, they knew that there's only so much you can do. So they did a great job in modernizing the police and probably producing some re-education of the police and trying to reduce the crime rates. But they knew that they had no power to address the roots of the crime. And they knew that their, their action must be very limited. As Juan Carlos said us in the beginning, I mean, how can you do this surgical interventions? I tell you, this is nice to say, it's very difficult to execute, to maintain the military in these surgical actions there. Uh, the, the roles of engagement are quite, quite fuzzy in, in these internal situations. So I don't advocate to use the Brazilian military in a permanent basis for that. And this is not what defined the military. And the military, the military in Brazil, I think they have this quite clear. So to finish, uh, I would say that the, the, so the, 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 first, the first point here uh, is the action of the Brazilian now, the Brazilian military now, that they are too close from the federal government. There are many military participating in the administration of Brazil, it's so well aware, where, and Brazil is now under this pandemic crisis. So how this is going to affect the Brazilian military ethos is quite important to observe. Uh, are they going to be able to maintain themselves outside of politics? 
and not being tainted by all these differences between political parties and, and political discussions. This is quite critical for them to maintain the credibility that the military today have, they had they has in Brazil. Uh, they have in Brazil. The last point I would like to address is uh, about what was said by Admiral Fowler recently uh, in our opening uh, presentation. He underscored the participation of SouthCon and the activities of SouthCon together in partnership with many uh, activists in the region. Well, the Paris Center has been doing such an extraordinary uh, role in that, working together with the Brazilian War Superior College in designing programs of common interest in which the U.S. brings his, its, its expertise, its perhaps familiarity with many, many wars and situations, and then Brazilians bring their own vision of their needs. And this equation goes to the mindset, to the doctrinal discussions, and there is a joint cooperation in that. In that. I think this is a good model for them for analyzing, for understanding the evolving role of the military in and that, that could be applied for many other countries in the region. Thank you so much, General. And thanks very much, Luis. So we've got a number of questions, and I, I'm I'm going to work hard to try to consolidate them so that we touch on a number of uh, of those that have contributed questions. Let me let me start off though, uh, Juan Carlos. If you would, there's a there's a question that it might well uh, extend to some of the other panelists, but but let's let's focus on you and and I think primarily for Colombia, this tension between the internal security and, and the Colombian forces have in fact been focused internally for well over 50 years uh, with their internal threats and the external uh, security threats, namely Venezuela from the Colombian perspective, and I would say probably from Venezuela's perspective, Colombia. Uh, so there's this, there's this competition between internal security and external threats. Uh, and then with that, you have the uniqueness of Colombia where the military and the police are in the, the same ministry. And, and so some of the questions have gone to the competition or potential competition of resources uh, and missions between the military forces and the security forces of a given nation. How does that, how does that competition play out uh, in the Colombian perspective if, uh, if you could address that, please, Juan Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, sir. So what I think uh, has happened in Colombia during the last 50 years, having the, the police and the military forces under the same minister has been an advantage for Colombia. Honestly, I think that the, the armed forces and the police have learned to work together. And that has been part of the success of the Colombian history. So I think that they have pretty clear the roles they have. When, when you see Colombia and you see the complexity of the geographical situation and of the, of the cities and the towns, there are towns that the only way to get them is through boat, by river or by an airplane. So places in where you have to have a robust system of security for allowing the other parts of the state to come and to work. So that has been like this for many years. So I do not see a competition. I see a very strong police in Colombia. I think that it has been an advantage to have a national police under the Ministry of Defense. This avoid problems of corruptions. This allow the government to move the people when, when they are problems. So, and, and, the, and the police has a very robust system, disciplinary system. So they can control the problems they have. Talking about the military, they have a clear mandate by the constitution, different maybe from other countries in Latin America. In the Colombian constitution, there is the responsibility for the military forces to respond for security. So they are involved, they are changing the doctrine, they are working very well in security, 
And something that is key for this complement between police and armed forces is intelligence. Intelligence has been key for the success of the military operation against all this kind of criminal groups that we have in Colombia. So I think it is not a problem today. The problem that I see, and I mentioned that in my, in my presentation is to keep legitimacy. They have to protect legitimacy. They have to avoid being involved in scandals. Otherwise, they will be affected in budget. They will be affected in size and they will be affected in credibility. And that will be very bad for Colombia. So I honestly expect the military forces really involved, <clears throat> learning and applying the new doctrine, working with other parts of the state with the hand of the police. And for sure, they will have the budget, they will have the support, and they will have the credibility they need to continue being very important for the stability of Colombia and the stability of our democracy. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Juan Carlos. Um, Inigo, there were several questions uh, reference your your presentation. Uh, if you would, if you would elaborate some um, on uh, fuerzas operadas por civiles, forces operated by civilians, and 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 then also uh, two other elements, AMLO's order that that recently came out. Are there any changes to to uh, to how things have been with AMLO's order, uh, and then and then uh, finally, um, if you would, the, the potential competition again between the military and uh, the National Guard, this newly created National Guard that is in fact coming from whole cloth, as it were, from from mostly military sources. Um, Indigo, por favor. Thank you, General, um, and and I. <laughs> I absolutely wanted to take the, the opportunity to politely challenge my colleague, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, on w which country has the most complex system. You see, in Mexico, we just don't just have one defense ministry, we have two. Um, <laughs> to further uh, confuse, um, furthermore, we have a new National Guard, which used to sit constitutionally under the Ministry of National Defense, and now has been moved over uh, to a civilian-led um, public security uh, ministry. However, the National Guard in itself is run 75% by uh, former army or commissioned army. Uh, officers and personnel. Um, and the recent AMLO um, agreement or order, which was issued May 8th, frankly, as I as I read through it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of it. Um, it has five agreements. The first agreement, uh, there's there's really nothing new. It, it expands the mandate for the armed forces to continue supporting the National Guard, which is, as we mentioned, primarily run and uh, supported by the armed forces, and uh, for for up to five years, so up to 2024 until till, till the end of the of the AMLO, AMLO administration, uh, versus 2021, 2022 which was the original plan, at which point the, 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 the National Guard would, 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 would frankly just take over. Um, so it, it, it basically it's extends that level of support, uh, but then at the same time, uh, urging uh, the, 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 the military to coordinate and in some cases subordinate to the National Guard. However, points four and five, uh, stipulate that the resources, uh, that the, the forces resources will continue to, to be run by each of the institutions. And point number five, uh, denies any control 
of, 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 of subordination from the National Guard um, or to the armed forces to, to the National Guard because it states that all, all, all control mechanisms will remain in place to the forces. So uh, just a little bit more confusing um, if, if, if we may. But in general terms, um, General, the, the Mexico has really struggled to try to create a national level intermediate force over the past 20 years or so. Uh, we saw that with the Federal Preventive Police, which then emerged into the Federal Police. Uh, we later found out that the architect of that Federal Police had been working for the Sinaloa Cartel. Um, and then that Federal P Police was absorbed uh, by the National Guard. Uh, and, and now the new National Guard is run by, by um, uh, retired or in the process of retiring Army General. Um, Luis, Luis, Bucio, Luis Rodriguez Bucio. Um, so along those lines, uh, basically uh, Mexico continues to struggle to stand up a uh, credible civilian led uh, intermediate force. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. And I think once again, Mexico has, has been struggling with uh, what to do um, with the internal internal threats for many years. And as you indicated, they they worked with the federal police and then uh, that didn't uh, pan out. And so now it's the National Guard's opportunity. Um, ya veremos. I, I, uh, I wanted to ask Fabien now, there's been a number of questions about Venezuela. Now let's, let's, uh, let's get real here. Venezuela is, is a one-off in this conversation because it's, it's really all, uh, uh, in, in the hope category, we're, we're trying to be uh, visionaries here, hoping that in a post Maduro regime, the, the, the military would come back to some level of professionalism. And so its participation, whether it be in security or defense, it's quite blurred as, as Fabiana has already indicated. Um, but, but let's deal with the here and now. I mean, it, well, there's there's two lobes to this, the here and now and the, and the right, right after, right after a, a post Maduro. So one question deals with how can the countries of the, the region help, and specifically the militaries of the region help to get the Venezuelan military back on track to uh, a, more, a more traditional or certainly uh, uncorrupted use. So that's that's one big lobe of the question. So how, can neighbors help, and what could they do? Uh, and uh, and then uh, whether or not there's there's any any effective way to get to the day after, which is the big question. Um, does it have to be a military intervention? Uh, we we had a a a very uh, failed uh, poor attempt at uh, 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 using mercenaries of late. Uh, that that was tremendously uh, ill-conceived. And now, um, you know, is it time for any other kind of intervention, or does does Venezuela have to wait for um, non? Um, no bellico, things that are not military in, uh, in their means. So how do we get to the day after military or not military and what can neighbors do? Aviana. Thank you. Um, I'll start addressing um, the part about how you thought Venezuela is an outlier. I agree 100%. I think we also have to remember that for many years, um, up until the 90s, pretty much Venezuela was an outlier for the opposite reason. For a very long time, Venezuela was one of very, very few countries that remained democratic, bucking the trend toward authoritarianism in the region. Um, and at that time, we political scientists and study uh, students of the region looked at Venezuela for answers for the rest of the region as to what could everybody else uh, learn from Venezuela. And now uh, this has reversed. So what can the neighbors who uh, do to help Venezuela. I am a very optimistic person. I want to find something for the neighbors to do immediately. Uh, but right now I think this, the 
the solution to Venezuela, the transition to democracy in Venezuela has to come from within um, Venezuela. I think what neighbors can do principally is to try to find positive ways to deal with the migration inflows of Venezuelans coming into their countries to prevent xenophobia so that when there is a turn and the country does become democratic, Venezuela's neighbors are ready to help and not resentful uh, of the migration waves that they receive. So I think that's important, uh, trying to lend a helping hand as much as their uh, budgets allow to Venezuelans coming in um, to other countries. And then I think to down the line, if there is a transition and there's a need to reimagine the forces, I think it would be interesting to see other countries in the region being creative and honest about what areas in which they excel and thinking about exporting that expertise to Venezuela. I think in a possible democratic transition, there might be some resistance to maybe taking um, leadership from the United States, perhaps even resistance to taking leadership from Colombia. So thinking a little bit more creatively about who future partners could be in a reinstitutionalization of the Venezuelan armed forces, it's gonna be key. Um, historically, for example, we know that Chile helped Venezuela create a germandery force uh, modeled after the Carabineros. So I think that kind of more creative new partnership, um, there's gonna be a role for that um, in a democratic Venezuela. As far as an effective way to get to the day after, to the extent that there's agreement on anything on the issue of Venezuela is that the regime maintains military support through economic power. I think certainly the crash in oil prices is weakening that economic power that the regime has over the military. Um, sanctions have attempted to get at that as well. And I think continuing to exert that pressure over the country uh, is probably the most effective way to try to get um, to democratic Venezuela, to weaken the source of power that the regime has now, which is economic power. Uh, again, being mindful of the population that is there and thinking early uh, and well about how to address uh, their humanitarian needs, both now as they flee the country and in the future in the event of a transition. Thanks, Fabiana. Again, I'd these are not easy questions, and I appreciate your your efforts as we as we go through it. Uh, let's turn to to uh, Luis and Brazil for a moment, and the the concern uh, by some is expressed in, in a question about a uh, President Bolsonaro uh, increasingly pulling the military into the political sphere of the country, and and then and then uh, using them um, more more directly. Uh, in his administration, uh, you can you can touch on that as much as you like, but but I think um, a companion question to that goes to something that uh, I read in your paper, uh, Luis, that talks about how interestingly the uh, the the very professional uh, Brazilian military uh, sees itself as a guarantor of. The, the constitution and and has gotten involved in the past and might well get involved in the future if it sees that the government is weak or the institutions are weak and putting the people at risk. So there's that, that co-partnership of using the military to support uh, potential weakness in the government. Um, is also a, a, a significant challenge um, within Bra Brazil. But the question lies, Bolsonaro and relying on the military uh, too much or trying to use them perhaps inappropriately and by extension, the role of the military that, as it sees it uh, historically, over. Sir, I think this is the most critical challenge for the Brazilian military at this moment because the administration has relied upon so many military. Some are there because they were elected. So they were previously military, as it is the case of the vice president, General Mourão. Uh, he, he, although he has this uh, large background as a military and, and probably his culture, his values 
but he was elected. So he is an elected person and, and became a political, at this point, he becomes a political uh, actor in the process. He's the vice president. Some others are there because they also uh, retired as military and then they were invited to populate a different positions in the government. But, but some of them are active duty military. Uh, for example, in the crisis in the Ministry of Health. And then there's a position between the President Bolsonaro, different from the governors, uh, regarding the lockout or regarding the uh, isolation of people. It's a critical position. I, I don't want to support one or the other. I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor and I cannot support one or the other. However, I see as a political scientist, the clash between these two positions. And then, of course, people may make the case that there are political interests regarding the next elections behind that, as it always happened with politicians. This is their case. So there's, there's a conflict between positions in there. Uh, in that case, uh, if the president tries to rely upon the military to support his position, there's another one, another dispute about the medicine that should be in use right now, that some doctors believe it would be helpful. Some doctors don't believe that will be helpful, but the president just is advertising the use of this chloroquine. So this creates another point of conflict. And then in addition to that, to that comes the, the supporters of president every Sunday, they come to the front of the palace and then the president goes and wave to them and say some things. So this gives some political support from the president to the people and encourages this reaction because they are talking against the high court, they are talking against the Congress, the population. So apparently is the, 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 the leader of the country, the leader of the executive power now supporting this uh, rebellion by the people. Uh, of course, you never know how many they are and the president has been uh, elected. So by using these conflicts, uh, the situation is probably feeding the extreme and the, the, the political disputes on that. So, uh, should the military be used in that? Should military voice something on that? They have been, they have been care very careful, the military in power or in government or the military outside, they have been careful, careful very, very careful in expressing their independence or their uh, distance from these critical political disputes. But this is a, this is a difficult issue. Uh, if you are in government, should you present your loyalty to the president, or you have to make the case, which is uh, the case in the constitution, that the military are subordinate to the state and they are not subordinate to eventual governance. So there is a, there is a competition between the natural loyalty of the military towards the, the boss, to the leader, the chief of the armed forces, and the, the loyalty of the military to the state. Uh, on that, yesterday, uh, former ministers of defense of Brazil, five or six, they published a document uh, advising or uh, the military or informing the nation that the military are subordinate of the state and not of the government. And so this is the critical issue on the military now. There is a risk in that. Uh, I'm an optimist. So I bet that in the end, it will prevail the strong Brazilian military culture, which will make the military try to be professionally away from these political disputes. Thanks, thanks, Luis. Uh, again, synthesizing a number of the questions has to do with uh, maintaining, gaining, regaining uh, trust. The military regaining, maintaining, uh, trust in, in the confidence of the population as an institution. And some have posited that uh, in, in some countries, the military has taken a step back and lost trust because of, of uh, uh, recent uh, allegations and, uh, and other occurrences. So this is a general question for, for all. And um, if you could just indicate by by raising your finger if you if you want to participate in, in the answer. Uh, how how does the military uh, maintain the public trust when it has uh, been denigrated or 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 reduced or even if they're in, in good stead, 
should the military have some sort of program to maintain uh, trust and confidence of, of the public? To the panel. Hey, Juan Carlos, por favor. And then Inigo. Thank you, sir. So I think that it is absolutely key to keep the trust from the population. So now we see that new threats are very violent, very violent, and they are in the middle of the population. So what is normal nowadays is urban warfare. And military forces have to, to show that they are relevant for this work. So they have to adapt the doctrine to operate in this new environment. Police is not enough. The criminals are so strong. So military forces have to prepare, have to adapt doctrine, have to adapt equipment, intelligence, precise weapons, and all this will contribute to be very effective in the mission that they have. And if they are effective, if they comply the law, they will be legitimate. In that sense, they will stay longer. So I think now that military forces depend on themselves. If they are credible, if they show that they are relevant, if they are effective, they are legitimate. And for sure, they will stay there and do a very positive work that all the society needs. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Inigo, I think I saw you sure. next. Thank you. Yes, well, uh, Mexico did go through this. The Mexican military did go through 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 this. Uh, traditionally, it had high, very high level of acceptance and trust from the Mexican population. We're talking about 80% um, um, approval uh, ratings. Uh, about 12 years ago, that, uh, or 10 years ago, that rate decreased specifically for the army in uh, at somewhat attached to the accusations of human rights uh, abuses. And uh, we saw that the Mexican military implemented a series of, um, of programs to extend their outreach to society uh, via establishing victim support centers, uh, looking at victims of crime, uh, victims of violence, um, a any type of um, wrongdoing that the that the Mexican military units had had undertook, uh, whether it was intentional or, or collateral, um, and uh, also complete transparency, like like Juan Carlos mentions, uh, opening up uh, bases, uh, having an open base type of uh, engagement. Uh, inviting the population uh, to come in and, 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 and really try to figure out what the armed forces did uh, all together. Thanks, Inigo. Uh, Luis, por favor. Yes, sir. As well as uh, the cases in Colombia and Mexico, probably, uh, Brazilian military is the most reliable institution just below the church. So all, all those encuestas, all polls that uh, they make in Brazil, the military are very high in the credibility in the population. And even just after they left power, they left in 1985, they were in bad shape perhaps, but they recover quickly the credibility. And they do that uh, not only because of the uh, untouched by corruption image that they do have, but also the sense of patriotism also, they, they have been present in, in all difficult missions. The military as subsidiary missions, they are present in everywhere. They are building railroads, they are building roads, they are bringing uh, aid. So, so they, they do this quite well, and I think they are in high in the credibility. But they are perceived as the credible and serious institution of the country. As, as just a short mention about the crime situation, um, so when people see the military on the streets, they know that they have something to respect. And what they tried in Brazil to resolve the situation of federal state versus uh, federal uh, government versus the state governors uh, to control the crime, they create an institution called Força Nacional de Segurança Pública, 
a national force of police in which they deploy this force in different situations. I think this is one of the right situations. They must leverage more this force and they must revisit the, the situation of the un units of uh, pacifying police as a way to uh, make better enforcement. They have to revisit that, that partial solution and having the military to support that. But so far the military have been uh, kept as the most reliable institution of the country. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Luis. Uh, once again, this uh, another very complicated or complex issue that um, is, is one that we'll continue to mull over with regards to um, maintaining and regrowing trust. Uh, Fabiana, did, uh, did you have anything to add on, on trust? Yeah, I think there, thank you. There's two separate answers. The answer for Venezuela is gonna be a lot more complicated and involve questions of transitional justice and what role did the military end up playing, if any, in a transition to democracy? I think that's gonna be key um, to determining whether Venezuelan citizens are gonna be able to trust the armed forces going forward or not. More generally in the region, I think the question of trust is linked directly to the issue that you discussed at the start of our panel, this difference between security and defense. We know that as the other panelists mentioned, the armed forces are generally ranked highest in perception of trustworthiness. Um, about 50% of citizens in most countries in Latin America believe the armed forces are trustworthy. At the other end of that spectrum is the police who is normally perceived as very untrustworthy. I think trying to figure out this gray area of what is more of a defense mission versus a security mission and trying to orient the armed forces um, away from traditional police missions is gonna help in preserving trust in the armed forces as an institution. And the more we go in the direction of blurring that line and assigning police missions to the armed forces, the more we're gonna risk uh, a deterioration of that trust. Thanks very much, Fabiana. And I'm mindful of the time. We are just about out of time. I, I wanna take an opportunity to thank all of our panelists for their very thoughtful presentations and responses. Uh, I, I apologize uh, to the audience that I did not get to everybody's question by, by half, but I tried to synthesize the questions as, uh, as I could. So thank you again. This has been um, uh, a, a very interesting conversation that will we'll continue uh, for a very, very long time. I think it is uh, very much a topic of the moment. I'd like to turn it over now uh, back to Brian Fonseca. Brian. Thanks so much, General. Thanks so much, General. Really appreciate uh, that excellent discussion. I want to thank all the speakers. I'll take the opportunity, by the way, to plug some of our recent work on militaries in the Americas. And so uh, uh, earlier in uh, 2000, earlier this year, um, uh, several of us came together to put together an issue in America's Quarterly focused on militaries. In fact, Fabiana has an exceptional piece in there on Venezuela. Uh, additional, um, additional pieces from Admiral Fowler, Frank Moore and I, and another sort of host of exceptional thinkers on the subject of military, uh, militaries. Additionally, FIU with the support from Southcom's analytic outreach program, and in collaboration with scholars from across the region, have conducted a series of military cultures studies. Of course, Luis Bittencourt referenced uh, the one he conducted on Brazil. Uh, so far, we've conducted studies on Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, Ecuador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Peru, and Venezuela, with forthcoming studies on Colombia and Mexico. Uh, again, rich, uh, inf you know, sort of rich uh, analytic work on sort of the considerations that shape and influence the culture within military institutions across the Americas. Um, so I hope you can join us again tomorrow. Uh, the, tomorrow we have two exceptional discussions. One is on the first starting at 11 to 12.30 is a discussion on the evolving security landscape with former NSC directors Juan Cruz and Dan Restrepo, former National Security Advisor to Mexican President uh, uh, Calderon, Fernandez, uh, Rafael Fernandez de Castro, uh, and the OAS's Secretary of Multidimensional Security, Farah Uricia. Uh, and that session will be moderated by SIPS, uh, Paula uh, Garcia Tufro. And then at one, we'll hear from Southcom Civilian Deputy Commander and Senior Foreign Policy Advisor and former U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador, Ambassador Jean Maines, for a discussion uh, on the role of women and gender in peace and security 
uh, throughout the region. As I referenced earlier, keep the conversation going on social media uh, using hashtag HSC2020 and be sure to follow us uh, on uh, through our social media platforms at, at Gordon Institute and at FIU LAC. It's been a great day. Thank you all so much for joining us. Look forward to uh, having you join us again tomorrow.